All right. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the book launch of uh, Man from the Future, The Visionary Life of John von Neumann. Uh, I'm Eve Mandel. I'm the Director of Programs and Visitor Services at the Historical Society of Princeton in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, we have an exhibition in our museum uh, called the Einstein Salon and Innovators Gallery, which we opened in 2016. And to accompany uh, our Albert Einstein collection, we wanted to feature uh, an innovator um, that you know, would be a contemporary of Einstein's and John von Neumann was chosen to be the very first featured innovator. Uh, to share that space. And so we were so thrilled to have on view um, many items, some of them borrowed from the Institute uh, and um, others borrowed from Marina. Um, so that includes uh, von Neumann's ID card from the Los Alamos assembly plant used for the Manhattan Project, materials relating to the development of the Maniac computer, as well as the Medal of Freedom that was presented to him by President Dwight Eisenhower in 1956. Um, so I was thrilled uh, when this new book was brought to my attention and that this program came together. And I'm so happy to have everybody joining us today. Um, it is the perfect use of Zoom. Um, while we do not have to be virtual anymore, I do not think this program could have happened were it not for Zoom. Um, we are bringing together people from around the world in our audience and, um, and our panelists from London to Princeton to California. Um, so it is very exciting. Uh, the quick housekeeping note before we get started, uh, that since this is a webinar, you can see our, the panelists, but we cannot see you. Um, your microphones and your cameras are turned off. Um, so we will do a Q&A at the end and you can feel free to enter questions at any time in the Q&A box, and we will address those um, after the talk. Um, and so always good to have a few questions at the ready, and, um, and that way you don't forget at the end when uh, we come to say, okay, time for questions. So we will take them, um, at, as I said, at the end, so we don't interrupt our speakers along the way. Uh, so now I am very honored to turn it over to my uh, colleague, Caitlin Rizzo, uh, archivist at the Institute for, for Advanced Study. Hello, everyone, and thank you to Eve for introducing me, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today from the Institute for Advanced Study community and beyond. We're so excited to have you all here. And I personally, as the archivist, am very excited to get the chance to talk about Institute history with our scholars today. Before we get started, I have the great uh, pleasure of introducing you to someone near and dear to the Institute community, Dr. Marina von Neumann Whitman. Dr. Whitman is the daughter of the late Dr. John von Neumann, who served as one of the earliest faculty at the Institute for Advanced Studies School for Mathematics. Dr. Whitman is herself a trustee emerita of the Institute for Advanced Study, having been elected in 1999 and a distinguished scholar. Dr. Whitman is a retired professor of business administration and public policy at the University of Michigan. From 1979 to 1992, she was an officer of the General Motors Corporation, first serving as the vice president and chief economist, and later as vice president and group executive for public affairs. Prior to her appointment at GM, Professor Whitman was a member of the faculty of the Department of Economics at the University of Pittsburgh, beginning as an instructor in 1962 and becoming Distinguished Public Service Professor of Economics in 1973. She served as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors from 1972 to 1973, and she received her BA in government from Radcliffe College, now Harvard University, and her MA and PhD in economics from Columbia University. She is the recipient of numerous fellowships, honors and awards, and holds honorary degrees from over 20 colleges and universities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marina von Neumann Whitman. Thank you so much, Caitlin. <laughs> um, just a few words about Ananyo's book, which I found particularly compelling because it's a biography, not of a man, but of his ideas, an intellectual biography. And therefore, as The Economist notes, it fills a yawning gap in the history of science. And that's highly appropriate because John von Neumann's favorite occupation was thinking. Let me just say a few words about the second part of the title of the book. 
That is, why is it called the man from the future? Well, for a couple of reasons. One is that he foresaw many developments. In the 1950s, he wrote a piece called, Can We Survive Technology? And in that he was the first to conceptualize and forecast uh, global warming. And in fact, he proposed that it would occur because of burning coal and oil. So this was long before uh, it became a byword. Secondly, he invented a number of things that became very important in the future. The stored program computer, game theory along with Oscar Morgenstern, but he never saw the breadth of the future applications. I think he once thought that the world might need about 20 computers for research purposes. Uh, so he wasn't a perfect forecaster by any means. Uh, and one of the things fortunately he was wrong about was that the human race might self-destruct uh, and he was somewhat pessimistic about whether it would actually make it to 1980. And fortunately on that, he was entirely wrong. So um, it's with great pleasure that I give this brief introduction to Ananyo's compelling and fascinating book and to Ananyo himself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess I shall take it away. Welcome, um, everybody. And thanks so much, uh, Marina, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen right now. So let's hope everything works as it should. Um, there. Um, there we go. Right, hopefully you are all seeing a slide with uh, the English edition, sorry, should have changed that, the English edition of my book, uh, The Man from the Future. So, um, and as uh, Marina quite rightly says, uh, the book is an intellectual biography of John von Neumann rather than a straight biography. And it's John von Neumann's ideas rather than his life that are center stage in the book. And we follow them uh, from the early 20th century right into the present day and, and beyond, I hope. It's a sort of hidden history of the 20th century. That's um, the way I'd like to see it. And it's the way it was described by, uh, by one reader. So a lot of conventional histories of the Second World War, for example, or computing or the Cold War, they leave out a key thread that helps make sense of it all. And that thread that runs through everything is mathematics. And the person that dreams up the maths or the math um, that connects up so much of the 20th century and our century too is the Hungarian American mathematical genius called John von Neumann. Uh, he'll be familiar to many at the IAS and Princeton, um, but uh, here's a quick introduction for those joining us from elsewhere. So, Janosch von Neumann was born in 1903 to a wealthy Jewish family in Budapest, and he died in 1957 in Washington, D.C., and he was the eldest of three brothers. He's the, uh, he's the mischievous looking one um, in this photo staring uh, straight out at you there. Most of his working life was spent at the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, where he was one of the first recruits along with Einstein, and at the time, Von Neumann was almost as famous as Einstein, and people who knew them both said that von Neumann's mind was just far sharper than Einstein's and unimaginably faster than anyone else's. He was a sort of genius's genius. Unlike many other brilliant mathematicians, though, von Neumann wasn't happy being cooped up in an ivory tower. He wanted to be out in the real world applying his mathematical mind to practical problems. And what I argue in, uh, in my book is that uh, more than 70 years after his death, uh, the full impact of those ideas are only now beginning to become clear. So what was he like? Well, as a child, 
von Neumann could speak ancient, some say eight digit numbers together in his head at a very young age, um, maybe uh, by six. And repeatedly, he knew calculus classic. It was on an area of maths called set theory. Now, I'm aware that many people at the IAS are going to know exactly what that is. But uh, for the benefit of uh, other people tuning in, set theory allows you to talk about groups of things. Um, and you may have come across Venn diagrams at school, for example. But more importantly, for mathematicians, it allows you to talk about infinitely large groups of things. And that's key because in math, you don't want to prove theorems about finite groups of numbers. Um, a theorem about prime numbers, for example, has got to apply to all prime numbers, and there are infinitely many of those. So at the time, um, worrying paradoxes were beginning to appear in set theory, and it was von Neumann's early work on fixing these paradoxes which would make his reputation as a mathematician of the very highest caliber. So what were these paradoxes? Well, they concerned sets of infinite sides. Um, specifically, where mathematicians started running into problems is when they started thinking about the properties of the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. Now, where's the paradox? Well, now bear with me. If the set of all sets that are not members of themselves is not a member of itself, well, then it should be because it's not a member of itself. But if it is a member of itself, then it shouldn't be, because then it would be a member of itself. Now, the non-mathematicians among you can think about that one later, but it's basically a mathematical version of the liar's paradox. And that is, um, this statement is a lie. Now, if that's true, it's false. If it's false, it's true. Now, this all might seem quite a silly thing for grown men and women to worry about, but these paradoxes were causing huge ructions in maths. Um, after all, if you can't talk meaningfully about infinities, then you can't do any serious maths. And if you can't do maths, you can't do science because the language of science is maths. And this is the problem that von Neumann sets himself for his PhD which he started straight after secondary school. And by the time he's 19, he has a draft. And in that, he recrafts set <coughs> theory to avoid these sorts of paradox. Um, but that wasn't all he was up to. Uh, von Neumann's father, Max, had insisted he study something practical as well as his maths PhD. So uh, von Neumann was also swatting up on chemistry at the University of Berlin and he was studying for a chemical engineering degree at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. So how did von Neumann resolve this crisis that had stumped so many older mathematicians? Well, in simple terms, he was very, very rigorous about his definitions. In his version of set theory, you can't really talk about a set of all sets anymore. So you can't tie yourself in knots when you deal with infinitely large groups of things. And, and this thesis, um, which as I said, he's drafted by 19, this, this sets the tone for much of von Neumann's future work. And what he would do is he would just take a seemingly intractable problem and he would reduce it to its bare logical essentials and then basically bulldoze it into submission. So von Neumann finishes his PhD um, at 22, and naturally um, he heads to the best mathematics department in the world. And in the 1920s, that's the one headed by David Hilbert at the University of Göttingen. So the 22 year old arrives in 1926, and he finds there's another whiz kid there by the name of Werner Heisenberg. And Heisenberg's the than him. So been pretty busy as well, and he's been formulating the scale of the atom. Now, von Neumann's drawn to 
this new science and he begins trying to make sense of the maths behind it. Problem. Uh, within months, his Vertex, there's another version of it by Erwin Schrodinger, this guy. Um, mechanics was based on matrices, which are grid of numbers, and hopping around and is based on waves. And these two versions gave the same answers, but they look really different, both in terms of the mathematical. Um, so von, von Neulichly speaking, these two different looking versions of quantum mechanics were actually both two sides of the same coin. Um, he carried on working on, on quantum mechanics, and this work culminates years later in a book, uh, which is called Mathematical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics, which would be the first really rigorous take on the new science. Um, and even now, some of the questions that scientists ask around uh, quantum mechanics, like, will we ever build a quantum computer? They're rooted in von Neumann's mathematics from nearly a century ago. After a year at Göttingen, von Neumann's offered a job at the University of Berlin, and in 1927, he becomes the youngest lecturer they had ever appointed. He was 23. Soon, though, he senses there's another world war coming, and he decides not to linger in Europe. And um, he's lured to Princeton after they offer him a position with a huge salary. And he arrives in the USA in January 1930, and his old school friend, the physicist Eugene Wigner, who's a future Nobel laureate as well, um, and uh, Wigner's also been offered a uh, position at Princeton, which they're supposed to share, although admittedly Wigner's salary is much lower than von Neumann's. Um, so they both arrived in America more or less together, and the two men agreed uh, then and there to Americanize their names. So Jano Wigner became Eugene, and Janusz von Neumann became John, or more often, Johnny. So Johnny was accompanied by his new wife, Mariette Covesi, as a childhood sweetheart, who he married just days before the voyage to America. And they enjoyed Princeton, America, uh, Princeton tremendously, as you can probably tell. And in this picture, von Neumann's here, if you can see my pointer, and Marriott sitting on Wigner's lap. Um, now, Princeton didn't have the cafes and bars where European intellectuals like to spend so much of their time and, and still do, if uh, truth be told. So Marriott began hosting salons at their home. And as the von Neumanns became wealthier and moved to a grander house, the parties became grander too. And those parties would soon become a thing of Princeton legend, um, where towards the end of the evening, eminent professors could be found rolling around on the floor drunk, as this one appears to be as well. So von Neumann's taste for fast cars was pretty legendary. Um, he never passed a driving test, so his driving skills, or rather lack of them, were pretty legendary too. And at Princeton, an intersection was pretty quickly named von Neumann's Corner because of the many smash-ups he had there. So on 6th March, 1935, Marriott gave birth to John von Neumann's only child, Marina, who is with us today. And here she is, aged 11, on a road trip with her dad. Uh, Marina told me that mass was never her strong suit, which I find difficult to believe. But that didn't prevent her from becoming a professor of economics and vice president and under Nixon on the President's Council of Economic Advisors. So um, the von Neumann seemed to have every reason to be happy. They were rich. Von Neumann had accepted a job at the Institute for Advanced Study by now, which envious Princetonians called the Institute for Advanced Salaries. He started on about $10,000 a year, 
which is close to about $200,000 today. And that was in depression era America. But not everything was going well at home. And in 1937, Mary left for a young physicist. Uh, Mary was instrumental in establishing the National Forest on Long Island. Von Neumann had by this time, or quite literally, had time for his buck. So he quickly makes himself indispensable to the US military, and soon he's consulting for the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. He also makes the acquaintance of a scruffy young English mathematician by the name of Alan Turing, who was something of a John von Neumann fan. Turing had asked for von Neumann's book on quantum mechanics as his prize for winning a school maths competition. And of course, Turing had read it in the original German. So von Neumann would provide a letter of recommendation to Turing so he could come to Princeton as a visiting fellow. Now Turing stayed in Princeton for a couple of years to do a PhD. And von Neumann then offered him a position as his assistant, but Turing turned him down, returning to England in July, 1938 and the rest is history. In 1943, von Neumann sent to England on a top secret mission for the Royal Navy. We still don't really know what he was up to, but we do know that he visited the Nautical Almanac office in Bath, and there he saw this thing in action. And if you're in London, as I am, then you can see it yourself because it's at the British Museum, um, sorry, the Science Museum. It's the National Cash Register Accounting Machine. Um, so this was a mechanical calculator that could do so much more than just add up. And it was in effect, a sort of early mechanical computer. And this appears to have helped fire up von Neumann's longstanding interest in computing machines. Um, and in fact, he, he writes a program for it on the train back to London. Um, so von Neumann's wartime mission was interrupted, though, when Robert Oppenheimer writes to him, begging him to join what Oppenheimer describes as a somewhat Buck Rogers project. And that Buck Rogers project turned out to be the massive secret American effort to build the atom bomb at Los Alamos. So von Neumann did join, and... He was instrumental in designing the more powerful implosion bomb. And this was the type used in the Trinity test. And um, in Fat Man, the bomb detonated over Nagasaki. And here he is at Los Alamos with a, with a young Richard Feynman and uh, one of his best friends, uh, the Polish mathematician Stan Ulam. So um, the design of the implosion bomb was a, a it was a far more difficult feat of engineering than the other bomb, which was called a gun type device. Um, with the gun type device, all you had to do was fire one piece of uranium at another at high velocity and you'd make a critical mass. So, uh, which was enough obviously to, uh, to begin the uh, explosion. So some of the scientists at Los Alamos though compared the problem of the implosion bomb to squashing in a can of beer without spilling a drop. And the answer von Neumann worked out was to arrange the explosives around the core in the shape of a truncated icosahedron. And you can just about make it out here like a modern soccer ball, although the uh, soccer balls of the time didn't look like that at all. Now at Los Alamos, von Neumann was asked to find more resources for bomb related calculations. And so he starts crisscrossing America in search of more computational power. And now in the summer of 1944, completely by accident, while waiting for a train, von Neumann met the mathematician Hermann Goldstein. And he discovers during the course of their chat that Goldstein's working on a massive room filling computer called the ENIAC. And here it is. Now, the ENIAC was the brainchild of uh, John Morchley, a former physics teacher, and Presper Eckert, an electronics whiz kid. 
Now, the ENIAC would be one of the world's first fully electronic digital computers, but it was designed for just one job, and that was to calculate artillery trajectories. Now, if you fire off a mortar shell, you want to know where it would fall under different conditions. There was a war on, right? So it was uh, sort of an early version of Angry Birds. Um, now, all of these very early computing machines were designed to do one thing and one thing really, really well. And if you wanted them to do something else, you had to rewire them like um, an old telephone switchboard. Now, modern computers obviously don't work that way. We don't have to rewire our iPhones, thank goodness, every time we want to switch apps. Although maybe it would uh, keep me off Twitter if it did. So it may not be a bad thing. But when von Neumann joined the ENIAC project, um, he quickly understood its limitations. He wanted a more flexible sort of uh, a computer, something that could be programmed to carry out any task without having to be rewired. So in 1945, he writes a really stripped down logical description of what a machine like that would have to look like. And the design he described in this report, which is called the EDVAC report, quickly became the standard for computers right down to the present day. And even now, practically practically every computer from smartphone to laptop is based on, on this design, which is called the von Neumann architecture. Shortly after the EDVAC report, von Neumann started getting funding to build his own computer at the uh, Institute for Advanced Study. But the project goes rather more slowly than he'd hoped. And with Los Alamos uh, breathing down his neck to get more computing power, he hits on the idea of converting the ENIAC into a sort of program computer. And his second wife, Clara Dan, this and a host of women who were already working. So in 1948, and from then on, the ENIAC can store and run any program, just like in first programs for this new setup. And the modern and this is a photo um, and uh, an atom bomb. And here's the team that helped build von Neumann's computer at the Institute for Advanced Study, which finally roars into life in 1951. Just a few years later, IBM will unveil its 701, which is its first commercial computer, and more or less a carbon copy of von Neumann's machine at the IAS. And this isn't entirely a coincidence because they'd hired von Neumann as a consultant a little bit earlier. Now, as a hobby, between working on the atom bomb and bringing the modern computer into being, von Neumann's also busy inventing game theory with the economist Oscar Morgenstern. So in between trips to Los Alamos, uh, von Neumann's meeting with Morgenstern in Princeton to hash out game theory, which is a sort of new mathematics of conflict and cooperation. And their book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, was finished in April 1943, and it weighed in at more than 600 pages. It was supposed to be about economics, but coming as it did at the dawn of the Cold War, game theory's first application would be to questions about nuclear deterrence. And most of that work would be done at the RAND Corporation, an influential defense think tank based in Santa Monica, where a lot of American nuclear policy during the Cold War would be shaped. Von Neumann joined Rand as a consultant in 1948. And here they are, the, the men, it usually was Ben, who, uh, who played the games. So Rand would become who's to game theorists and pretty much all the industrial doors at some point being most can also be the birthplace of the most notorious that may be familiar with. Economists, on the other hand, were relatively slow to adopt game theory. Um, the maths was um, too hard for many of them. It was only in 1994 
that exactly 50 years after the publication of von Neumann and Morgenstern's theory of games and economic behavior, the game theorists were awarded the Nobel Prize in economics for the first time. And that same year, auctions designed by game theorists were also used to sell off chunks of the radio spectrum to telecoms firms, and this made billions for the American government. But nowadays, game theory also makes billions for tech giants like Google and Amazon through auctions that sell keywords for their online ads. Now, despite consulting for Rand, von Neumann's interest in game theory was waning by the late 1940s, and he was far more interested in computers, and more specifically, he was interested in computers that could make more computers. So 300 years earlier, when the philosopher René Descartes had told his student that he believed the body to be nothing but a machine, his student, who was the 23-year-old Queen Christina of Sweden, snorted and said, I never saw my clock making babies. Now, what von Neumann did was to show mathematically that clocks could indeed make babies. His theory of self-reproducing automata proved for the first time that machines could grow, reproduce, and evolve over time. Now, there are three things that anything needs to make copies of itself, von Neumann said. First, it needs a set of instructions that detail how to build the replica. Second, it needs machinery to do the work, a sort of construction unit. And then third, it needs some way of creating a copy of the instructions and inserting it into the new machine. And this was five years before the discovery of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick. But we now know that every organism more complex than a virus has an instruction set in the form of DNA, cell machinery to turn that code into meat and bones and other stuff, and, and third, enzymes to copy the DNA code. And of course, von Neumann knew this and he, he says as much when he's describing it that uh, his theory of automata, uh, automata could be applied to living things. So von Neumann later described a sort of two-dimensional machine that could reproduce itself. And this creature lives on an endless grid. Each square of the grid can be in one of 29 states and communicates with its immediate neighbors. And what von Neumann showed is that starting with an incredibly complex configuration of these squares, it was uh, possible to create something that made copies of itself. And it would take nearly 50 years to show that von Neumann's automata could in fact reproduce itself without a hitch. The first simulation of von Neumann's machine in 1994 took over a year to replicate, but on a modern laptop, it takes minutes and here it is. So, Von Neumann's automata theory would eventually inspire ideas about everything from nanotech robots to 3D printers that can print their own parts, from moon bases that build themselves to self-replicating spacecraft for exploring the galaxy. But he wouldn't live to see any of it. Um, on 9th July 1955, von Neumann collapsed at home. He was diagnosed with bone cancer and rushed to hospital for emergency surgery and by the end of the year, he is in a wheelchair. The following March, he was admitted to hospital again. And as he lay in his hospital bed, he was desperately writing his last legendary lectures comparing the computer and the brain. And these lectures would build a bridge between neuroscience and computer science for the first time ever. He left hospital just once to accept the Medal of Freedom from President Eisenhower. Von Neumann died on 8th February 1957, and his best friend, the Polish mathematician Stan Ulam, who probably understood the breadth of von Neumann's ideas best and wrote about him in his memoirs, um, wrote, he died so prematurely, seeing the promised land, but hardly entering it. And I'd argue that more than 60 years after his death, we're just beginning to glimpse von Neumann's promised land for ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anano, for that wonderful talk. Um, we did get a few notes in the Q&A that there were a, a couple of points where audio may have been flaky or cutting out. 
So we did just want to say thank you for your patience. Um, we are streaming from across the pond in London where we are at a high point in digital traffic at the moment. Um, so thank you for your patience and we will post the recording. And um, if you miss anything, please feel free to ask questions. At this point, we will open up the Q&A. So if you have any questions for Nano, please feel free. <coughs> And I can get us started with uh, the first, maybe this is a comment for everyone here, but uh, some trivia from Andrew Marco in our audience, who says, I was a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in 1970 to 1971. I and several other visiting members had offices in the EC, the Electronic Computer Project Building, where Dr. von Neumann housed his pioneering electric, electronic computer. Um, so thank you, Andrew, for that comment. Um, I will give the floor to Anano if you'd like to say anything about the building itself, but I will maybe also add as the Institute Archivist that today that is the Crossroads building where our uh, families drop off their, their young children. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, von, von Neumann was uh, was fond of kids, and uh, he was uh, he was famous for um, treating children in a way like little adults and conversing with them as as equals. Um, I think originally the uh, the computer project was housed in uh, less salubrious accommodation, though, right? I think it was next to the uh, next to the toilet downstairs. <laughs> um, so uh, clearly, the the building was something of an improvement. Um, I can see some questions coming in. Um, uh, okay. Oh, all right. Um, I do see another question. I'm going to just remind all of our participants if you could ask in the Q and A function, um, just so everyone can see your questions. But we do have one that came through the chat, so I'll go ahead and ask okay. that one. Um, this one is from Steve Hiltner, who asked, what might have been von Neumann's fate if Veblen um, and Oswald Veblen, who was another mathematician in the faculty of the Institute, and the IAS had not offered him a position at Princeton? Gosh, what might his fate have been? Well, um, he was very determined, I think, to leave. And um, it it's interesting to speculate about a mathematician of his caliber. I mean, he was famous. So I think ultimately he was. And he did dedicate um, quite some energy to, to helping other uh, scientists leave. Um, and of course, his own family was uh, wrapped up in what follows. I mean, most of his immediate family, I think, made, uh, made good their escape. Um, thanks in part to, to Clara Dan, who actually went back to, uh, to Hungary to, uh, to get them out. Um, but uh, he had, um, whilst his prescience failed him later when he predicted that Stalin's uh, Soviet Union would start a third world war when he was uh, extremely worried about that, he, his prescience served him well um, because he predicted... Um, that uh, the Second World War would start and uh, European Jews would um, face uh, possible extinction. Um, so had Princeton not offered him um, safe harbour and, uh, and the IAS later, and this was back in 1930, I would hope that somebody else would have uh, got him out. But um, I think he was very aware that um, many others were not so lucky. I want to also just offer uh, Dr. Whitman, if you have any insights, <laughs> please feel free to jump in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I, can, um, I can say something uh, funny about uh, uh, Tony. Tony's question, was John, John a, a good chef? Uh, no, he wasn't. And uh, Marina, in fact, told me so. Um, she cited... Um, uh, an incident which I don't mention in the book, when Marriott, his first wife, was uh, was sick. Um, you know, von Neumann came uh, sort of bumbling upstairs to a room and asked if there was anything he could uh, he could do for her. And, he, and she says, I, I really like a, 
soft boiled egg. So von Neumann disappeared off downstairs to the kitchen and he's gone for quite some time. And eventually he comes back up looking rather sheepish and Marriott says, well, you know, what's the, where's my soft boiled egg? And he goes, Marriott, the egg's not soft yet. So um, I don't think he was a particularly good chef. Um, um, shall I take on some of these others? Is that okay? No, my, my father had the ability, and I think it's true of, of many geniuses, to be and remain completely ignorant of the details of every, everyday life. And that's just one example, but there were others. Yeah, it was, it was a great one. I'm sorry that I couldn't include it. Right. Um, uh, coming up, because there's, uh, there's some brilliant questions here, which I'll, I'll do my best with. Um, uh, Andrew, I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, I, um, I can't go through everybody in that photo. Wigner and um, I believe Wigner's second wife is in the foreground. Um, and there are other academics from the IAS, but you can easily find out who else is there by buying a copy of my book, which I can heartily, heartily recommend. Um, did John von Neumann have interactions with Claude Shannon at Bell Labs? That's from Kim Gallagher. Yes, he did. In fact, um, although again, it's not one of the things mentioned in my book because there was just too much to write about. Um, uh, he actually proposed that Shannon call um, his idea of sort of uh, information loss, as it were, entropy. So that was uh, quite a contribution um, already. Um, so um, what was the substance of the interactions between John von Neumann and Turing? That is also in the book. Now Turing's um, Turing, uh, what has uh, obviously his first paper, he was a von Neumann fan, his first paper related, I think, uh, to von Neumann's 52nd. And then uh, Turing, von Neumann and the rest were all very um, engrossed at the time, early on in, in answering Hilbert's questions about, um, about, well, really about making maths as rigorous as it could possibly be. And so Turing's paper um, on the universal machine um, was uh, very much of interest to von Neumann, although, as it turns out, wasn't of very much interest to many other people in Princeton at the time. So von Neumann took note of that, and they, they sort of formed, along with Kurt Gerdell, this, um, this, uh, this uh, central considering what was and what wasn't provable um, using step-by-step -step processes in mathematics. And this would inspire our whole thinking about what we now call computer algorithms. And this would turn out to be um, very important when people started thinking about computing machines just a few years later. Um, did he survive, <laughs> Lauren, did he survive the relative lack compared to Berlin of good cafes and places to sit and talk in Princeton? I think he certainly did, isn't that right, Marina? Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that their parties were pretty legendary and um, he enjoyed his drink and uh, would, uh, he found noise conducive to good thinking and uh, to, um, to, proving, um, uh, to proving theorems. Um, did von Neumann work with Rudolf Piles? Um, I would be surprised if he didn't. Um, he was at Los Alamos. Um, so I would suspect he did. I don't know for sure. Um, uh, Chris, I think I've, uh, Horneman, I think I've answered your question. He had lots of interactions with Alan Turing. How much they actually talked about real computers um, is a bit of a mystery, but they certainly talked a lot about maths. Um, and um, uh, von Neumann certainly noted uh, Turing's paper on the universal machine, which, um, was in retrospect many years later, um, uh, it became the, the sort of cornerstone of modern computer science. But as I noted the book, thanks to um, historians like Thomas Haig, we really know that this was done retrospectively. Um, uh, Turing was going about trying to solve 
one of Hilbert's problems. He wasn't trying to design a computing machine with that paper, at least. Um, do you know what programs John von Neumann ran on actual computers? Yes, he ran uh, lots of atom bomb uh, uh, programs, of course, and uh, nuclear bomb programs. And uh, very famously, it's only mentioned very briefly in my book. Again, there's just too much to talk about. But the very first um, computer weather forecast was uh, carried out on um, the IAS computer with a team um, that he encouraged and was a member of. Um, uh, and uh, this this is really rather incredibly important. And um, yes, auto automata did run on it um, in a sense, um, as again, you can find out by reading the book. Um, he didn't run those programs, but um, a, a crazy biologist came along later um, and uh, ran something which we would probably recognize now to be an automaton, although uh, I don't think he saw it that way at the time. Um, what motivated you to write this book? Oh, Carl, it was a moment of madness. Um, uh, <laughs> I, um, I had spent years as a science journalist and um, von Neumann's name just kept um, cropping up more and more often. And then um, one day I went back home and um, I did an experiment. Um, I was a former scientist, so I couldn't resist. I, um, I looked at the popular science books on my shelf and just started grabbing some at random and looking in the index. And I found von Neumann's name was in more than half of them. So I thought, surely there's got to be a book that sort of brings this all together. And so I started searching and I found there was a biography of him written by Norman McRae back in, I, in the 1990s. But um, to me, this didn't really explain why, you know, we should regard him now as, as important or influential. Certainly he was um, incredibly clever and, uh, you know, we understand that from von Neumann's biography. But, but actually what we don't really understand is what he did scientifically and why that's so important today. And um, so I, I saw this opportunity to write a book about him and I, I left a rather nice job at The Economist because I couldn't see any way of juggling a full-time job with a book. And this turned out to be rather unfortunate timing as a, as a pandemic then descended. And I was uh, writing the book along with trying to homeschool a recalcitrant 10 year old um, at the same time, whilst my wife was also being called upon to, uh, to lecture in the downstairs room. Um, so it was an interesting experience all in all, uh, but the book took uh, a little longer than it might have done as a result of all of that. So uh, two and a half years. Um, uh, da, 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 da. So sorry, I'm looking down this uh, list now. So um, let me see. Maybe I can help out. There is yes. one question at the bottom for uh, Marina. Could you please talk about your relationship with your father? What was he like? Uh, and she adds as a father, but I think we can say broadly if you'd like to talk about any yeah. aspect. Obviously, um, to try to really talk about that in depth would take a great deal more time than we have. I <clears throat> do talk about it uh, in my own memoir called The Martian's Daughter referring, of course, to my father as one of the Martians. And um, one of the things that my father and I used to have time alone together uh, when I got breakfast for him and we had breakfast together because his wife, Clary, was a late sleeper. And I guess I was in my teens at the time. And one of the things that, um, I noted uh, was that he really had these two sides of his personality. That on the one hand, he could be very witty and clever and uh, entertained me magnificently. And at the same time, there was underneath a deeply cynical, pessimistic, uh, idea of human nature. And uh, as 
he raised he the question he raised in that piece on can we survive technology was a real pessimism about whether the human race might not blow itself up uh, to kingdom come by 1980. So there, there were these two aspects of his personality and he could switch very quickly from one to the other. And as a teenager, I learned to uh, eventually to keep up with these shifts. Um, but I, I think that they were quite challenging to, to follow. And uh, obviously, even in those aspects, which had nothing to do with mathematics, uh, to follow his incredibly quick mind. I just accidentally uh... <laughs> dismissed a question so I'm going to ask it so it doesn't get lost. Um, thank you everyone for for handling my uh, Zoom QA mishap. Um, we had a question from a former archivist at the IAS, which is why I jumped in. Um, Mark Darby, who is an archivist at the IAS in the 1990s, asked if you could talk a little bit about kind of the different uptakes of uh, John von Neumann's um, he, of interest in John von Neumann in terms of the history of mathematics. Mark mentioned that in the 1990s, he saw most requests coming from Japan around the, the legacy of von Neumann. And it sounds like uh, now there is more of an Anglophone interest. So um, maybe if either of our panelists can speak to that. Um, I... I'm afraid to say I have no idea why um, why on earth uh, there would be an interest in Japan in 1990. Um, I don't know. Um, well, I mean, his his the Norman McRae biography, I believe, is only translated some like two decades or something later into Japanese. So why in the 1990s there'd be um, interest in his in his work? Um, especially as I don't know what particular aspect of his work, I'd find it difficult to, to speculate on. Um, I um, wonder, I mean, there seems to be an uptick in interest about that uh, weather forecasting project that he did. And um, I can't speak much to that. I've read a little bit about him and you can find some... Um, you can find more, of course, on, on Wikipedia and, and the usual sorts of places. Um, uh, uh, Dyson's uh, great book, Turing's Cathedral, uh, which is more focused on the IAS computer, um, has a chapter on it as well. Um, uh, so I, I, I know Jules Charney was involved. They were, I believe, um, trying to uh, um, uh, kind of do a better job than uh, past forecasts done um, and so but um, beyond that I can't I can't speak to that um, I wonder what um, I'm sorry I've forgotten his name but the previous arch archivist had in mind uh, I, you know, uh, what the more recent um, requests were, um, would know anything more about that. Could I interrupt just for a moment to explain why I think at least that uh, Dyson's book was called Turing's Cathedral, because it's all about von Neumann. And I think that the reason is that Turing laid the blueprint, if you like, um, in his universal tape or whatever it was called. And von Neumann um, built the cathedral in uh, the stored program computer. Now, I haven't actually asked George Dyson if that's the reason for the title, but it's certainly my belief that that's why, I mean, people have been confused by the fact that the title is Turing's Cathedral and yet 
the book is all about von Neumann's computer. But I think that is the reason, at least it makes sense to me. Well. I have a, a question I'll, I'll ask um, both panelists. Um, if uh, you have anything to say about Von Neumann's, uh, if you might have expressed any qualms about his participation in the Manhattan Project. Yes, well, this is a big one. Uh, um, Mar Marina, do you want to go first on this one? Um, well, Eve, I didn't quite understand. If who had qualms? Uh, did, did your father have qualms about his participation in the Manhattan Project? Uh, well, I, I was a child at the time, but my impression is none at all. Um, he had very realistic, you might call them, or pessimistic views uh, about things. And I think his view was, uh, in fact, he's been quoted as saying, um, when we had the atom bomb and the Soviet Union didn't yet have it, um, if you say bomb them tomorrow, I say do it today. And if you say bomb them at five o'clock, I say at four o'clock. And um, I, I think in a way he meant this seriously, not that he actually was recommended that we go and drop an, an atom bomb on the Soviet Union. But I think that was sort of uh, one example of his very realistic, if you like, view of the world. Yeah, I, I think um, what I'd add to that um, is um, he was a man who had uh, um, predicted correctly that there would be a devastating world war. Um, he correctly predicted that um, European Jews faced extermination. And here he was um, at the end of the Second World War, um, terrified and you know at the end of that war millions of him he um was absolutely terrified that the end of the world was nigh within a decade um and he was predicting that very uh very clearly so given that his previous predictions had been so correct and uh, von neumann certainly had confidence and he had reason to have confidence in his own predictions of uh, of doom. Um, whilst you can't excuse his um, uh, argument in in favour of preemptive war, you can certainly understand it. Um, he also changed his mind later. And as I give um, some more historical context in in the book, this idea of a preemptive strike on the Soviet Union was not an unpopular one uh, at the time. And in fact, um, Lord Bertrand Russell, who's famous as a, uh, as a pacifist, actually more or less argued the same thing. He basically said the Soviet Union should be threatened with a strike and if they don't give up their, um, um, then, uh, you know, then we should make, then the US should make good on it. And uh, those claim, you know, the end, and the technology should be given over to some sort of world government. So this was a surprisingly, well, perhaps not that surprising when, when we think about what had just happened, but it was a, a view held by many intellectuals and indeed some people within the American important um, charged with, uh, with decision-making. So I think, um, so I think that's part of it. The other thing is, although he may not um, certainly have expressed any regret, um, it was very difficult for him actually to to um, uh, 
his, his worldview was such that he believed that essentially technological progress was almost inevitable. If it wasn't him, then the Soviet Union would develop it themselves. So, you know, when you almost see it in that light, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to have regrets. But I, I tell you what, um, there is uh, um, just one incident cited in both book, which is gleaned from um, Clara Dan's journals. And it's quite clear that von Neumann lives in, in terror of nuclear war. I mean, there's this, the incident that I'm referring to is when he comes home from Los Alamos, um, goes to tire, uh, goes to bed completely exhausted, mentally exhausted, and wakes up 12 hours later in the middle of the night and starts babbling about um, essentially the end of the world, about nuclear technology, and then moves on to his fears about um, computers, essentially, which he thought might, uh, might uh, also be an even more destructive weapon in the wrong hands than, um, than the atom bomb. And, um, and of course he coins the term uh, singularity to describe this point in our technological future beyond which you know, we, we can't see at the moment. Um, and he never sells to a computer and live happily ever after, or much more likely would it mean that we would um, destroy ourselves um, in, in that process. Uh, would the technological singularity essentially end the human race? Uh, would we be destroyed by some hyper-intelligent art? Right. I've tried to answer the question rather broadly. I think um, but the best way, uh, way to end this is on a more positive question, since obviously that was a, a deep one. Um, perhaps, um, let's see, I saw someone had, Chris had asked, and I don't, I don't think this one had been asked yet. Um, what would you currently say is the most impactful of all of Von Neumann's accomplishments, given our lives today? Right. Um... Well, um, I mean, I, I call the book the man of the future, and in a in a in a way, in a way, he always will be. And in ten years' time, we'll be looking back and uh, still um, thinking about his prescience in some ways. I think it's difficult to deny that um, this logical description of the modern computer is uh, currently not the most impactful. Now, people will argue that. You know, other people have got would have got to that in the end, but you know, this is we have the von Neumann architecture now, and I'm I'm just gonna, you know, put that out there and, and take that on its um, take that um, as read. But I think you know, uh, game theory is um, tremendous of tremendous practical use. It's um, shaped for better or worse the way that we think about um, the use of bombs and its. Um, also shape the modern tech economy and the way we think about regulating, um, in fact, the modern economy. But I think um, for me, what I found absolutely enthralling uh, was von Neumann's theory of self-reproducing automata. And, and curiously, just as uh, the book came out in Britain in October, an American group um, published their work on something they called uh, xenobots. And these are um, kind of stem cells that are I think, partly designed by an artificial intelligence, by a, kind of a, um, a neural network. And what they do is they sort of spin around in a Petri dish and they capture other stem cells, which then also start to spin around and capture more cells and, and the process sort of goes on from there. And so what we really have is for the first time, a, a really practical embodiment of von Neumann's self-reproducing autom automaton in, in real life. I, I, don't, I don't think that's mentioned in that paper, but that's what it is. And um, I have a feeling that um, in 10, 15 years, we might be looking back on that theory 
and thinking um, again about uh, how prescient that was. And um, by contrast, you know, 20, 30 years ago, when uh, McRae wrote about wrote von Neumann's uh, first biography, he was very dismissive of this work. And I think, you know, 30 years later, we, we're just beginning to see that in fact, um, there was something quite, um, quite uh, foresighted um, um, and almost rather eerie about that proof. So. This has been wonderful. I know we could keep keep talking as there's so much to talk about, but I, I'm going to be mindful of our time and and thank and, and Anno and, and Marina for, for your time today and 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 talking with our audience and, uh, and Caitlin for partnering with us at the Historical Society. Um, this has truly been a pleasure and um, I encourage everyone to to learn more by reading the book and um, and visiting the Historical Society's exhibition and um, taking a trip into Princeton. You can visit von Neumann's uh, grave, uh, Princeton Cemetery. So there's you know, so, so much where he is still surrounding us uh, today. Um, so with that, I will sign off and uh, thank everyone again. Thank you very much. Thank you.